Okay, let's continue now into chapter 13 where we're introduced to the first and the second beast. Verse 1, chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And, I, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Okay, we have really shifted gears here now. A beast. We had mentioned this in the past, but the word for beast here is therion. Therion is, is mentioned 46 times, or used 46 times in the New Testament, and only six verses outside of Revelation. So it's primarily used in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> and it's translated as a beast, a wild animal, or metaphorically as a brute, a brutish man. And if we think metaphorically in all this, it will all make much, much more sense. An example of metaphorical use would be in Titus 1.12, where one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Well, Cretans are always liars. They're evil beasts. They're what? Evil therion. Lazy gluttons. It's a brute of, brute of a man. And also this verse... Uh, in, in chapter uh, 13, verse 1, it links the beast to the dragon. So we know right away that the beast and the dragon, they're like combined. In, in reality, the beast, the Antichrist, is uh, Satan incarnate. Um, he is totally possessed by Satan. And we read in chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 9, where a great dragon with seven heads, huh? ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. Now, we read ten earlier, but there's going to be uh, three that are going to be lumped off. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Now, also this beast is rising out of the sea, and the sea would be among the Gentiles. Uh, the ten horns, the seven heads, the ten diadems on his horns, the blasphemous names, as well as the leopard, the feet like bears, the mouth like lions. Well, guess what? This takes us back to the prophecies of Daniel. And so we'll just quickly skim over some of these. Uh, Daniel 7 is the primary chapter where Daniel sees in, in verse 4 a first beast that was like a lion and had eagle's wings and then a couple of verses later he sees a second uh, beast like a leopard with four wings and this beast had four heads and dominion was given to it and then the next verse he says after this i saw in the night's vision behold a fourth beast terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong with great iron teeth that devoured and broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet this was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one. So coming out of the fourth beast, before, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So there's your ten minus three. And behold, in this horn, were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things, which we find out later is nothing more than blasphemies. But we read on, verse 19, Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with teeth of iron, claws of bronze, and devoured and broke to pieces, and stamped what was left in, with his feet, and about the ten horns that were on his head, and the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell, and the horn that had eyes, and the mouth that spoke great things. I mean, Daniel, his brain was just cluttered with all this stuff, and that seemed greater than its companions. And as I looked, this horn 
He made war with the saints. Not only that, this horn prevailed over the saints. So once again, this is this is Daniel prophesying about Jacob's trouble, about the great tribulation. So uh, this horn made war, war with the saints, prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came, the second coming, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom, which we know to be the kingdom of God. Verse 23, thus he, now this is an angel talking to Daniel, said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, because this is the Antichrist kingdom. This is going to be very different. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. And as for the ten horns, well, out of this kingdom there will be ten kings that shall arise, another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. And he, the Antichrist, is going to speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This is going to be the great tribulation uh, as well as Jacob's trouble. And shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years, the last three and a half years of uh, Daniel 77. And uh, we went all over this uh, in, a, in a much earlier class when we went through uh, the chapters of Daniel. So, now, out of all this, we've had something that recently happened, this is reported by uh, Washington Watch, so uh, you could you could uh, do an internet search on them and get this whole story. But here's the headlines: United Nations unveils a strange beast statue at their headquarters that was donated by by uh, Mexico. And this is a quote out of the uh, story. It says the United Nations has launched a website promoting what a new world order essentially validating what conspiracy theorists have been saying for generations. And look, we have on the right the beasts in Revelation, and on the left we have uh, the statue that is now uh, mounted at the United Nations. So, interesting occurrences. Let's read on. Verse 3. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. But its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Okay, what to make of this? Uh, let's look at some clues. First and foremost, on one of its heads, it seemed to have a mortal wound. It was not a mortal wound, but it seemed that way. So that's a clue. Um, and then um, on one of its heads, heads is also interpreted Revelation in other places as kings, Revelation 17. And this passage about heads in Revelation 17 gives more clues of this beast who that was and is, is to come. And so we'll read there. Um, 17 verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. And quite often mountains are referred to as kingdoms, uh, like Mount Zion. It's not referring to the hill, the mountain. It's referring to the kingdom um, on which the woman is seated. And they are also, they are also seven kings. Now, he's seeing seven kings, but five of whom have fallen. They have passed away. One is, and the other, well, he hasn't come yet. And when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. It will be... Therefore, a revived seventh kingdom and empire, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Now, we'll discuss this 
much greater detail when we get to chapter 17. But for now, let's look at the Islamic Caliphate, also known as the Ottoman Empire. Uh, both of those combined, and they reigned from 632 AD to 1923. The Ottoman Empire was the largest, most powerful, longest lasting empire in the history of mankind. And it fits quite well into the definition of the seventh kingdom. It seemed to die, um, it seemed to have a mortal wound, what, in 1923, after World War One. But guess what? The Ottoman Empire, there's efforts to renew the, this empire and its power. And that would make it the revived eighth kingdom in John's vision. So this is how it all looks. There are seven kings, right? Five of whom had fallen. So if you look at the first five on the list, we got the Egyptian Empire. They have fallen. The Assyrian, they have fallen. The Babylonian, they have fallen. The Medo-Persian, they have fallen. And the Grecian, they have all fallen. Now, during John's time was what? The Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire is the current one in, in his mind. That's the one that is, the kingdom that is, that was existing in 100 AD. Okay, but then the Roman Empire, like the, all the others, it fell. And so it was replaced later down the road by the Islamic Caliphate. The Ottoman Empire. So this is the seventh kingdom that has not come yet from the perspective of John at 100 AD. And then, of course, we know that collapsed in 1923. But as we have explored in other discussions, there is efforts to revive the Islamic Caliphate. And if that happens, this will be the eighth kingdom that was, because it was, is not, it's not today, but it belongs to number seven, the seven, the Islamic Caliphate. And so watch that space. And then just to remind ourselves just how massive uh, the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire was, uh, in Daniel's uh, words, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong, much more dreadful and terrifying than the Roman Empire. Um, and you can see its territory was absolutely massive and Middle Eastern centric and Babylonian centric, which you see is in the red dot. So let's read on. Because now the beast, the Antichrist, was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed. It was allowed by who? It was allowed by God. God tolerates a lot to make a point, right? To exercise authority for 42 months, three and a half years of great tribulation and Jacob's trouble. And actually, it was more than allowed. God decreed this. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. And this will be the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel and by Jesus Christ. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed... Once again, decreed by God to make war on his own people, on the saints, and to conquer them. This is all part of refining the church uh, to separate the sheep from the goats. Uh, that, was the, um, that was spoken of in the Olivet Discourse. And authority was given it, it the Antichrist. Once again, decreed by God over every tribe and people and language and nation. Because we're talking about what the universal church, which is a global um, institution. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Every, everyone that is whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world. In the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So, in verse 8, we have, uh, And all who dwell on the earth will worship 
at. What is the word worship? The word worship is proskuneo, and it means to do reverence or homage by kissing of the hand. However, in the New Testament, and listen to this carefully, it's to do reverence or homage by prostration, okay? By falling down on your face, by prostration. So let's read on. Verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Well, this is just like uh, uh, the letter to the seven churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Because this is important. We need to pay attention. So what is this message? If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with a sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Now, if we didn't have verse 9 in the second half of verse 10, this would read nothing more than a uh, predestination summary of how the saints are going to be taken as prisoners, placed in concentration camps, and uh, be executed. However, the verse ends with, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Compares also what we'll read in the next chapter, 14 verse 12. Here's a call for the endurance of the saints. When the Bible repeats itself, when it reiterates itself, we need to pay attention because it's very, very important. So there's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Um, there would not be a call for endurance if this was all predestination. We need to endure. That's, the, that's what we need to do. We need to persevere. But then again, Revelation 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Also, remember Revelation 6, 11, the breaking of the fifth seal, where there was martyrs and uh, below the altar, crying, how long, Lord, how long until uh, you know those that sin against us, their sins are avenged? And what were they told? The end cannot come until the full number of martyrs was complete. So more had to die of martyrdom, many more. Therefore, it's, all, it's both happening, um, that being captivity and sword, with each case, however, giving glory to God. And that is our desire. So let's read on. Verse 11, because in verse 11, now John sees another beast rising up out of the earth. Remember, the other one was out of the sea. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, however, in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. You know, this, so this is almost like a, 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 a twosome, a partnership, uh, almost like uh, what? We got also going on around the same time, what? Two prophets, two witnesses in Jerusalem that's sanctioned by the Lord. Well, this is a little different. Uh, now compare with the first sea beast that rose from the sea. This now gives us Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, which many theologians refer to as the false trinity. Uh, this false prophet has two horns like a lamb, so he mimics the Messiah. Uh, but instead of like the spirit of Christ, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Because what? He spoke like a dragon. So this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. However, like the Holy Spirit that is promoting uh, worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this prophet is promoting the worship of the Antichrist. It's not seeking its own glory. It's promoting the glory of the Antichrist. And I'm sure of the beast. Uh, no, of Satan. Um, so, the worship of the first beast, and that's what's being forced now, is worshiping Worship the first beast. Worship, once again, is the word proskuneo. And it means 
to do reverence or homage by prostration. Let's read on. Verse 13. It, now we're talking about the false prophet, performs great signs, even making fire coming down from heaven to earth in front of people. So this is almost like uh, in the courts of Pharaoh in the Exodus. What, you had Moses and Aaron uh, doing things, and then you had uh, the Pharaoh's magicians doing their thing. And once again, it's it's more the same. So they're, they're performing great signs. This is what Jesus warned about in the Olivet Discourse. If you remember in Matthew 24, he says what? For false messiahs, false prophets will come and what? Perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But the elect that knows scripture, that knows and understands the difference between an antichrist and a real Christ, they will not be deceived. However, verse 14, and by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives. He's, this, this prophet is a deceiver. That's his trade. Those who dwell on the earth, those, however, are referring to those who do not love the truth. And we'll get into that a little deeper. Telling them to make an image for the beast, so make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. Wow, what's this about? So that the image of the beast might even speak and might even cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Well, keep in mind here, what John is seeing and reporting is from a first century AD perspective. Okay, that's important. Uh, and making an image for the beast, it does not say make an image of the beast. However, verse 15, it kind of almost seemingly contradicts uh, because now we're talking about the image of the beast. However, in both of these verses, in the Greek language, there is no to, there is no of. The translator has to decide if uh, a word like to or of or from or for is needed. And so literal translation would be the image, the beast. Okay? which is also something that's very important to consider. Whenever we start to not understand things, it's very important to look at the original text, the verbs, and the verb tenses. These are all very, very important and crucial because so oftentimes um, a word may have more than one meaning, and the real meaning is both meanings, not just the one translated meaning. And then many times... Um, uh, the words that are missing are missing there for a reason and a purpose. So, do we have anything like this? Well, actually we do. Uh, it was found in Jan Daniel chapter 3. If you recall, King Nebuchadnezzar, what? He made an image of gold. And this image was, what, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide. So it was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And then what? He, he summoned his whole kingdom. And and then gave instructions, there was instructions given that you must fall down and worship this image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So they will, they will die. So we see here an image that uh, so often uh, it's an artist's rendition. It kind of gives us an idea of uh, what was going on here, right? Maybe not. Let's look a little deeper into this. First and foremost, this image was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, or 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide. Now, you take a statue of the dimensions of a man that was, uh, you know, 2 plus feet uh, wide and, and 6 feet tall, that would put him into a dimension of 6 cubits by 18 cubits, which you see there on the left, uh, would be how it would really stand. And if you stretch him out to 60 cubits, well, guess what? That is a long and skinny guy. And I don't think that's what uh, the people were being asked to worship. So, um, and then also keep in mind, Nebu the passage never does say this is an image of Nebuchadnezzar. It says it is an image of gold. That's all it says, other than its dimensions. So, 
With that in mind and the dimensions that we see, what would resemble that? Well, an obelisk. An obelisk uh, could very, very easily, naturally be in a 6 by 60 cubic uh, size and dimension. So, okay, so what did John see here? There's, well, we're going to do some, we're going to do some speculation here. So this is hypothetical, but uh, to me, it's worthy enough to discuss, okay? So, what do we have here? We have a minaret, and a minaret that's standing up tall, just like an obelisk, right? Now, remember, John is reporting this from a first century perspective. So, in this picture of the minaret, uh, you see speakers, and... John is not going to know what a speaker is, but when the speaker starts blurring out, it's like, whoa, this image was allowed to, I mean, it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might even cause those who would not worship by prostration, remember, that's the word, the image of the beast um, to be slain. So, I mean, it's like all of a sudden now, that first century AD perspective and reporting put into a modern perspective, um, maybe it helps us see a more clear picture of what he's talking about. And as far as worshiping by prostration, well, let me just give you one example. And this is an example of worshiping or at least prostration at what? what's called the Kaaba. All Muslims all around the world, three or five times a day, doesn't matter where they are in the world, are supposed to align themselves to this image. The Kaaba before Islam, it existed before then, and it housed a black stone, some think it's a meteorite, um, and statues of pagan gods. However, um, Muhammad supposedly cleared all that out, um, and the Muslims believe that the black stone was actually given to Ibrahim by the angel Gabriel. And then, of course, Muhammad made his final pilgrimage in 632 uh, AD, uh, which was the year of his death, and thereby established the rites of pilgrimage to the Kaaba, which is practiced today. Every uh, uh, every um, Allah-fearing uh, Muslim is supposed to make a pilgrimage at least once in their lifetime if they're able and see and touch the Kaaba. Verse 16. Also, so there's more to it. The prophet is already forcing worship of an image, an image that has breath of life in it, also, it causes all. So it's, this is for everybody. There's no exception, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. To what? To be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he has the mark. Now, this could be very easily uh, implemented, especially in the Middle East theater after all the wars and, that's gone on, the famines, uh, the supply chains being cut off, uh, the 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 small supply, the hard demand, <clears throat> that if you don't have the mark, you're going to starve. You're going to die of hunger, of thirst. Uh, you will not um, have any, any of the essentials of life. So, what is this mark? That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, what does that mean? Well, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is, and it's cut off here, but, but it, it is the mark of uh, the man, um, a man. So, the mark on the hand or the forehead uh, is either the name or the number of this person's name 
a person's name. Let me see if I can change this just a little bit because this is important to read it all. My apologies. So this calls for wisdom, and let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast for what? It is the number of a man, and his number is 666, or 666. So this mark that's on the hand of the forehand is refers directly to this brute of a man, the Antichrist. Now, to be marked on the hand of the forehead to a first century AD audience with Jewish background, yeah, that made perfect sense. Yeah, that was the practice of what we're doing today, of placing a, a tefillin or a phylactery, which is a box that contains scripture that's strapped to the head, to the head and the hand with leather straps and all kosher made, very carefully made, to be worn by what? All Jewish men during daily prayer, but not on the Sabbath or on major Jewish holidays. And there's examples in the Bible. I mean, two uh, that are very familiar with is Exodus chapter 13, 3 through 10, and verse 16, and Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 8. The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Um, and then to wear that on, on the hand and on the, on the, on the head. But let's, let's read this a little bit. Also, before we go there, to calculate a person's name, well, that's clearly understood, too, by first century A.D. audience. That's, that's gematria. I mean, that's where letters correspond to numbers. And, oh, by the way, the Hebrew language doesn't have any numbers. So they're, they're, they have no choice. Letters correspond to numbers. So anyway, let's look at this. The Tefillin. Exodus 13, verse 3. Moses said to the people, Remember. Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand of Yahweh, the Lord brought you out from this place. So first and foremost, what has happened, God wants uh, the Jewish people to always remember and to commemorate this, this happening, this event. But it, instead of just uh, once a year, let's read on. You shall tell your son on that day because it is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the Lord, the law of the Lord, the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth for with a powerful hand Yahweh brought you out of Egypt. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and as a phylacteries on your forehead. For with a powerful hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt. And what you see in the picture here is an Israeli soldier that has bound a tefillin on his head and on his hand with scripture. Uh, as part of his daily prayers. Okay, what about the gematria? The gematria, uh, like I said earlier, uh, the uh, uh, the Hebrew language or the Hebrew alphabet, there there are no numbers. It's all uh, it's all letters, and then letters correspond uh, to numbers. So when we look at the Hebrew. And it's not the alphabet, it is the aleph bet, which is the aleph is the first letter of the alphabet, and bet is the second letter. But you will see that each and every uh, letter has a number corresponding. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, and all not further 70, 80, 90, down to even 300 and 400. So all these letters have numbers. So uh, you take uh, my name, for example, David, my name, remember there are no vowels, it would be Dalif, Vav, Dalif, uh, DVD, with an A and an I in between. Uh, that would be four 
plus six plus four. So the so the numerical value of my name would be fourteen, right? Okay. Now with that as a background, let's move on. Um, the Hebrew uh, first and foremost, we're told that the numerical value of the beast is six six six. Okay. What is it that John is trying to communicate? And first and foremost, remember that in prophecy, so often we have uh, a current interpretation and a far-off interpretation. So the current would be a type and a foreshadow of what's going to be in the future. Well, in the current, they had what? A Caesar. His name was Nero Caesar. and spelled in Hebrew, Neron Caesar. It added up to 666. Uh, and so that was his way of saying, beware of Caesar uh, without mentioning his name. Because he's just saying, well, you know who I'm talking about because you can calculate his name as 666. However, there's also early manuscripts that they don't say 666. It says 616. Well, interesting enough, uh, remember, this is um, the day of uh, Greek language being a predominant language. In fact, Greek language itself had a gematria. But, uh, but if you take Nero Caesar's or Neron's Caesar name and put it with a Latin spelling, that would be Nero Caesar, which would be 616. So that's a little background uh, of possibly what we're talking about when we are warned to calculate the name of the beast because it is the name of a man. Moving on. So, having said all that, there are so many Christians today that are worried that they're going to take the mark of the beast, that the, the mark of the beast maybe is going to be forced on them like a... Like a uh, the vaccine is the mark, and they're being forcing us to, to take on um, the vaccine. And, oh, now I'm going to die and go to hell. No, 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 beloved. That is not the case at all. First and foremost, um, the path to damnation is a path of man's free will. This is willfully worshiping the beast, willfully rejecting Jesus as Lord. Uh, this is nothing forced. Even though we w w could be at a crossroad where we're saying, you have to do this or you die, well, I choose to obey God rather than man. So let's explore this. Revelation 14, 9, because it's a very damning passage. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, Guess what? He also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they will have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. And if that doesn't literally scare the hell out of you, then um, you hate the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all wicked deception, because now Paul is explaining what is going to happen at the end of the end of days and why is it happening the way it is. Why is it we're seeing people that just willfully are rejecting the obvious and staring them in the face. We don't understand. So Paul says, well, guess what? With all wicked deception for those who are perishing, why is that? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. What's staring them in the face, they won't see it. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth. In order that all may be condemned, uh, the separation of the, of the sheep and the goats, the refinement of, of the wheat and the chaff, 
um, so that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's a sad, sad reality to life. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of who? Not the believers, the unbelievers. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Therefore, God turns them over to Satan. If you want to read more, I would uh, strongly recommend reading uh, Romans chapter 1, especially the second half, starting from about verse 16. Uh, and compare that also maybe with Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, so the path to damnation is a path of free will. It's not force. And consequently, there's no change to the path of salvation. Nothing has changed. Okay, it's always Roman 10, 9. It always has been and always will be. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what? You will be saved because it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's your own free will of accepting what's being freely given to you that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth, the, our testimony, the word of our testimony that you profess your faith and are saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 2, For by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. So we need to persevere. We need to endure. We need to hold our ground and stand firm on the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ and our path to salvation and the gospel, the gospel of God's coming kingdom, because we're not home yet, but we will be. Come, Lord Jesus, come. So on that note, come, Lord Jesus.